We are now turning in our discussion of human nature to a topic that, sorry, could best be described as evil, when humans are at their absolute worst, and we'll look at these examples and see what they help us find, especially what these are good at is giving us a sort of backdoor way of looking at our innate nature. What do people do in the most abnormal circumstances? I think this reveals what their natural instincts are like, even though I know when you think of that, well, Jeff, those are the worst cases. Yes, but I think we'll see a more complicated or subtle idea of human nature when we look at the worst cases beyond the usual stories, the way these things are framed. All right. Let me begin by giving a tangent story, right? just to give you a basic story about an experience of someone I know who faced some pretty, pretty radical cruelty. So this was a student at uh, Trinity in Chicago when I was at grad school there, and here's what they said. They were home on Christmas break. They were working on a big project, and they were going to work on it at home during the three weeks we had off in December. When they were there, they said that they had went to a church service late at night. I know, what a dork. And so when they got out of this church service, it was like a Tuesday night, it was about midnight, and it was a really beautiful night. So they went down to their one of their favorite places, which is this little uh, boat docks, this little arena full of boats, and they were walking around, and quite literally, this is what they were doing, they were humming songs from the church service, looking around at the moonlight shimmering off the water, listening to the boats creak. They said that this was just a brilliant night, really peaceful, and they were just reflecting on how good their life is weird. Now what happened is as they were kind of lost in thought, they saw like someone spit on the ground next to them. Now let me explain how that works. They were at this lower level, right, but there was a pier overhead, right, so the boats were docked below, but there was a pier over their head, and it was pretty obvious what was happening is someone was spitting down at them. Now, they glanced up, and they didn't recognize any of the people, so these were strangers. And there were about three or four people that were spitting down at them, they said. What they did is they tried to pacify the situation. They didn't do what some of you would have done, which is scream at these people, and you'll find out why that would have been a bad idea in a second. So, they acted as if they didn't even notice the spitting was happening, and then just pretended it was time to go and started walking away. The problem was, to walk out of there, they had to walk up a ramp that put them right by where these four people were, turned out to be four. And as they were starting to walk up, the four dudes start walking down the ramp. Now, this is what, he, what the, my buddy said. I made sure to pretend that nothing was happening. I made sure to have a really calm and peaceful demeanor, and when I walked past each of them, I greeted them. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? As I walk past each of them. Then, as soon as I get past all four, this is what he told me, I breathed a sigh of relief and, re and thought, of course, quietly, gosh, what a bunch of jerks. Why do they have to act like that? As he's thinking this, the four guys grabbed him from behind, dragged him down the ramp, and started kicking him in the face and head. He said that he must have gone unconscious, right, from brain trauma fairly quickly, but they kept kicking. Because he said, I curled up and covered up my face, and so they were first kicking me in the back and in the head. But when he did wake up, we'll talk about that, mo a lot of his injuries to, were, were to his face. So after he had stopped being conscious, they kept kicking him in the face and head. They had ended up caving in some of his teeth. He had pretty significant brain trauma, some brain damage, right? Now, what happens next? So let's tell the story, right? So far, it's, I hope it's a little riveting, but this is sad because this is someone I know. He said, and this gets fascinating, when he woke up, it took him, he said, a half an hour to figure out how to work his hands to get into his pocket to get to his car keys so he could sit in his car. It is the next morning, by the way, at this point. He woke up, not where they beat him up, but on a little beachfront area about, what, a hundred yards away. And he was soaking wet. 
It is unclear what happened, but I would imagine that what happened is they maybe beat him up and he fell into the water off of this dock. And then they probably thought, oh my gosh, we can't kill this guy. So either a bystander or maybe the guys that were doing the beating. So someone had to get in the water and drag him out because that's where he woke up on a little standy area. Anyway, back to the story. As he was trying to get used to his keys, eventually the police showed up. And not just one cop car, but a bunch of them. And they surrounded him in this parking lot where he was trying to figure out how to use his keys to get into his car. In other words, his brain is really out of whack right now. The worst part of the story is he says that they sat around and the police were chuckling at him as they were asking him questions. Now, to try to give them the benefit of the doubt, I'm assuming that they thought this was some drunk or drug addict who got in a bar fight. I don't think they immediately realized that this guy was innocent and beaten up by some strangers. Anyway, they are laughing and they're asking him questions. And when they ask him, what's your name? He said he sounded like this. Right? What was terrifying for him is he says that he knew fully consciously what his thoughts were. Right? So it's not like he was groggy or drunk. It's that his body, or maybe even his mind, wouldn't obey his intentions. He, when he was trying to say, I am so-and-so, it came out as just nonsense. The police were laughing again. I guess they thought he was a drug addict or drunk. But eventually, an ambulance showed up, took him to the hospital. He passed out at this point. Um, he said he only woke up hours later, and then his parents were there. And the real bright spot in this, the only thing that really helped him cope and not just get incredibly depressed, was a really sweet nurse. He was struggling to say anything, but a nurse came in and said, please don't worry, what you've done, and this is how she said it, you've lost your marbles, but don't worry, your marbles will settle back down. In the coming days and then in a few weeks, in a case like yours, you will start to relearn how to talk very quickly. You will build back up your ideas about things really fast. So I can imagine that everything is clear in your head right now, but you can't communicate. You will get that back. Your marbles will sort themselves out. And most of the time, you'll be fine. That helped an incredible amount. Let's get to the punchline of the story. That was actually me. I was pretty severely traumatized by this uh, psychologically. I didn't deal with a whole lot of PTSD. We'll talk about PTSD in a few, in a couple of class sessions from now. But um, what was interesting was being trapped in a mind where my thoughts were clear, but I couldn't communicate them. It was, it was fascinating to deal with this. So I am sure that you have a handful of questions, right? Let me say, the first question I usually get about this is, what happened to the people who did it, right? Or, oh, sorry, the other question is, why didn't you defend yourself or something like this? Okay, so uh, let's take the second question first. I was completely overpowered and thrown off by these guys. And luckily, I just tried to protect myself without fighting back. Because, as it turns out, they were doing this as a robbery spree and they had guns. And what would happen is if anybody defended themselves, then they got out their guns. So, for those of you who think, hey, I go to the gym, I would have fought back, I hope you wouldn't have been shot if it was you, right? So it turned out what I did was the best uh, mode of self-defense. Second, were these people punished, right? Notice how we immediately worry about the criminals even often before we worry about the victims, that is sad. But what ended up happening is these crimes started escalating so much that one of the four guys actually uh, pled, right, that he was guilty in order to face a lighter sentence because he was freaking out about how bad these crimes are going to escalate. He was afraid that they were going to soon start killing people. And so he confessed, all of them went to jail, but as our justice system works, the victim isn't told a whole lot about the case. And so the last I heard they were in prison and I don't know much about it after that. The other interesting side note is these are actually four Marines on some sort of leave from Camp Pendleton, which was nearby where this boat dock actually was. It was me home visiting my parents in California. And so the idea is most likely they would face regular criminal justice, and then face military justice, which I hear is way harsher. 
So we'll see. Who knows? How did I handle this in moral terms? Well, what was neat for me, and this is pretty common and some of you might have this experience, is everyone around me was incredibly frustrated and angry. They wanted to see these people punished. I actually was able to forgive them pretty quickly. Within, say, 48 or a few days, when I was really clearly thinking, I started just feeling sorry for these guys. What kind of a person could do that just to an ordinary stranger? And then I realized that kind of a person, what their setup was, how were they being treated by the military, just made me feel sorry for them and forgive them. Now, in a perfect justice system, what would I have wanted? I would have wanted them to tell me what they did, to actually apologize for what they did. That's the only thing that was missing from my recovery, was just being acknowledged as a victim and having the actual perpetrators confess and apologize. That would have helped great. Now, I ended up recovering emotionally pretty quickly, right? And psychologically, intellectually, within a few months, I was able to speak clearly. And within probably four or five months, I think I was right back to where I used to be. Long-term effects though, I am a little bit dumber since then. Oh, 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 pause, pause. Right now, you're a little panicked, right? Some of you, you punks, are saying, oh my gosh, I've got a brain damaged teacher, right? I want my money back. No, please understand. Nice try. I had most of, I have gotten most of my degrees since this happened. My work isn't as good as it used to be, so there was a drop in intelligence, but it was still plenty good. I still test at right near genius, right? So don't worry, I'm still a big nerd. And again, I've gotten my uh, a couple more degrees since then, so I'm still fully qualified to be your teacher, right? Thanks. <laughs> good. All right. I tell that story not to make you feel sorry for me or just because it's a compelling story. Right? And by the way, they did reconstruct my teeth, so my teeth were really jacked up and some were broken. Right, So I was that adult wearing braces a couple years ago. Right, Anyway, I tell that story because I just wanted you to see that I have faced a little tiny bit of evil or cruelty in my life. Some of you have worse stories, I am so sorry, but I just wanted to show you that this is not purely academic when I talk about things like evil in the world or talk about the justice system or talk about how we should forgive people who do harm to us. I am not just talking from theory. I faced a little tiny bit of this. So now, back to these stories. So let's look at the World Bank and Ford memos and then the Anderson trial explanation. First, the World Bank. Let me read it. Memo from Lauren Summers, the CEO of World Bank. Just between you and me, that's my favorite part. He thinks this is a private memo, but people like me have leaked it everywhere. Yay! Just between you and me, shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of the dirty industries to the LDCs, less developed countries? The measurement of the costs of health impairing pollution depends on the foregone earnings from increased morbidity and mortality. From this point of view, a given amount of health impairing pollution should be done in the country with the lowest cost, which will be the country with the lowest wages. I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we should face up to that. All right, that is of course incredibly harrowing and creepy. What's the idea? Should we limit toxic waste? Should we pay a lot of money to clean it up? Or should we simply pay off the, the deaths that occur? Well. Letting people die is cheaper than cleaning it up or paying for its good disposal. So this is what the World Bank is recommending. Let me explain the policy and then let's go on a few tangents about Larry Summers and the World Bank. So what it is saying is, if we are trying to determine how to calculate the cost of dumping toxic waste or cleaning it up, well, we have a cost that we have to approximate. What is that? People being killed or at least getting very sick. How do we measure that cost? Well, there's the secret in the memo, from foregone earnings. So, if I'm going to dump a bunch of toxic waste, let's say, in Bill Gates' backyard in Seattle, well, according to this way of calculating, I owe Bill Gates, if he's sick, or his family, if I kill him, all of the money he, wouldn't, he would have earned in his lifetime if he wasn't dead due to my toxic waste. Well, 
that's not a very good calculation. I would owe that family billions of dollars because that's how much money he would have earned if we didn't kill him with our toxic waste. So what do we do? Well, let's find a really poor country and in the true story of some of these events like Mozambique in Africa, and how do we calculate how much it costs to kill people with toxic waste there? Well, how much money would they have earned if they weren't dead? All right. Sorry, Mozambique family. We killed your dad with our toxic waste. Sorry about his leukemia. But here is $6,000 because that's about how much he would have earned if he was still alive. Okay, now we're even. That was a good deal. Now, by the way, when Larry Summers, CEO of World Bank, says they should do this, they did end up doing some of this. The World Trade Organization, which is the bureaucratic institution that oversees the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, they actually had Mozambique. Because Mozambique had debts to these institutions, they had Mozambique change their laws so that they could accept toxic waste for money to pay off their debts to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So let's look at the World Trade Organization at its creepiest and focus on the World Bank. Let me try another one of my neat little satires. I have a new business proposition for you. What we are going to do is blow up some houses. And then we are going to hire ourselves to refinance the reconstruction of those houses. So we get to blow up houses, then we get paid to refinance its reconstruction, and Step three, we'll hire our buddies as the engineers to rebuild the houses that we blew up. Oh my gosh, that is a great business plan. Well, that is actually pretty close to the business plan of the World Bank as it deals with the United States government. What happens? So you have wars like Iraq, you have wars like Vietnam. Well, what happens next? When the wars are near a close, the people who are in charge of the war policies are hired at the World Bank. So when it comes to financing the countries that they just blew up, they get to be in charge of the financing at the World Bank. This is true of Eisenhower after World War II. This is true of Kissinger after Vietnam. This is true of Wolfowitz after Iraq. These are some of the leaders in planning these wars. They then, they then become in the leadership at the World Bank to reconstruct the companies. And in the case of Iraq, what the World Bank does is hire KBR. This is Dick Cheney's company, the vice president under George Bush when you guys were little kids. They pay that engineering firm to reconstruct Iraq, so the business model is actually fairly true in the case of Iraq. Yay! Alright, so now let's do a brief tangent about Larry, Larry Summers. This could go on way too long, so let me try to keep it short. Larry Summers was fired at the World Bank for this memo. So then, oh my gosh, because he had such shame, did he get a radical demotion? No, right? He then became the president of Harvard. And then, what do you think happens? He writes another memo that gets out and gets him fired. This memo is talking about how he shouldn't have to hire women in engineering and math because women just don't have those aptitudes. Oh, dumb Larry. So he does this, gets fired from Harvard. Where does he go next? Does he get a radical demotion? No, of course not. He gets a huge promotion. He is now working under W. Bush at the White House. When Obama comes into office, does he get a demotion? Because how was financing in the economy during W. Bush? Terrible. So does he get fired and demoted? No. Obama hires him and he gets a promotion even farther up as an economic advisor for the Obama White House. Then, what almost happened is he almost, after this, got the biggest promotion you can get as a finance operations officer or as an economist. He almost became the most powerful economist in the world. What is that? He was almost hired as the Federal Reserve Chairman for the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the bank that has the biggest impact on the global economy. Now. What happens? There's actually a good ending to this story. Obama nominates him for the federal chair position, and what happens? A bunch of nerds like me write in, write, send emails to the White House, do not hire Larry Summers. He has a bad financial record. He has bad ideas about how the economy should work, and he's a terrible person. Fortunately, this worked. 
and a bunch of nerds not only said Larry is a bad guy, but they also recommended a much better person, Janet Yellen. She was just as qualified with a much better track record, so Obama took Summer's name out, put Yellen's in, she was hired, and our economy was the better for it. Right? We did really well under Yellen's leadership. Now, of course, Trump said, I'm going to fire her as soon as I get into office. That's his thing, firing anyone connected with Obama. Luckily, he didn't fire her right away. She helped stabilize the economy and continued doing the same efforts. If you track how the economy has been doing since Trump took office, it has been following the exact same course as Obama was under. Anyway, he has since fired her, so we'll hope the new guy does well. All right, so now let's turn to the Ford Pinto. This is a very famous memo. A lot of people know about this one. Let's read it first. At a top secret site, more than 40 times in every test made at over 25 miles per hour without special structural alteration of the car resulted in a ruptured fuel tank. Two points. How fast is 25 miles per hour? That is you in a parking lot. If you pay attention the next time you drive, although you should be staying at home for the coronavirus for now, but if you realize most of the time you're driving, you are going over 25 miles per hour, whether you're in a neighborhood or even in a parking lot. So this is a very slow accident. And what does a ruptured fuel tank mean? I wish we were in class because here's what I would ask. I would say, can anybody tell me what a ruptured fuel tank is using onomatopoeia? I would pause, someone would realize what onomatopoeia is, and then say, a ruptured fuel tank means boom. It means your car is on fire, and unless you can get out really quickly, people are burning to death. Yay. So, what did they find? A later Ford company study released by J.C. Eckel, director of automotive safety for Ford, claimed that an improved design that would have rendered the Pinto less likely to burst into flames on collision would not be cost-effective for society. The cost of the design improvement far outweighed its social benefits. This is how these people write and talk. How much would it have cost to fix the Pinto? $11. But what did they do? They did the math, and they realized it would be cheaper to just pay off these deaths and let, the, let these cars burn and explode, and we'll just pay it back. Instead of fixing the cars, it's cheaper to just pay for these deaths. Now, of course, we run into the problem. How do you calculate the price of a debt? Well, they found $200,000 seems to be fair. We'll talk about how they got that calculation, but realize what this means. Your mom is just burned to death, or your, or your daughter or teenage son is burned to death in your Ford Pinto, and Ford usually settles out of court for $200,000. That's how much we see that your family member is worth. How do they get this number? Two things, and this is macabre. The first one is, this is an average out-of-court settlement. How many lawyers does Ford have? Tons. How many do you have in your little family? Well, you're going to go into debt trying to hire lawyers to deal with their lawyers. So they say, you are going to save money if you simply take the $200,000 settlement. The other side of this number is, be, is from the average cost of health insurance payouts. At the time, the average health insurance payout if you die was about $150,000, and so Ford said, all right, that seems fair. Here is what your health care policy was on your daughter, so that must be how much she's worth to you. This is insane. Now, are these sorts of cost-benefit analysis very common? Sure. Now, notice what they are saying. They are saying that paying off these deaths and leaving the cars on the market without fixing them for $11 per car is cheaper for society. No, that sounds absurd. And the first thing you would, would immediately think, if you're incredibly cynical, is I guess society means Ford. Well, no, it's a little sneakier than that. What they mean by society is not just Ford and its profits, but they mean the stockholders in the company. Now, technically, who are stockholders? Well, it could be anyone. And stockholders change all the time. And what is your job as Ford? By the way, this is legally how it works in the United States. This is not the norm in other countries. 
The job of a country is to maximize dividends for its owners, for its stockholders. If a company makes any move that doesn't clearly maximize profits, the stockholders can fire the leaders of that company. And so, what is the company's job when it comes to society, meaning stockholders, do what makes the stockholders the most money. So if society is stockholders, then they did the right thing because all the stockholders care about is increasing their dividends. Now, is this common in society? Sadly, yes it is. And sadly, American car companies are the ones that keep caught doing this. My favorite example, GMC came out with a new truck when huge trucks were all the rage. You know how Americans are. Every other country in the world is saving fuel by buying little cars. Americans keep buying big cars, right? That trend seems to wax and wane. But in the height of this, when people were driving Hummers and H2s, right? GMC wanted to keep up with the trend, so they took, now what do they usually do? They just take their standard car and put a new frame on it. They don't re-engineer a whole engine, they just take, well, for example, what is an H2? An H2 is just a GMC Yukon that they put a huge body on top of. That's all it is. And then they charge you a ton more by saying it's a Hummer. It's barely a Hummer. In this case, GMC had a new huge truck, but they really just built it on their regular size truck. But what did this mean? It was too heavy, so the gas mileage was terrible, so it needed a bigger gas tank. Well, there was no room in the frame of the car for this huge gas tank because this was actually a fairly smaller truck. So what did they do? They built an extra gas tank into, wait for it, the gigantic wheel wells in this big new truck. What does this mean? They found a loophole in the regulations. They made the gas tank outside of the frame of the car. This makes it even worse than the Ford Pinto example, because now you get in a basic side swipe and ruptured fuel tank, boom. Luckily, someone leaked these memos and so this production was stopped pretty quickly, but I do think some of these were made, but again, they were all for it because they were just gonna do this cost benefit analysis again. It is terrifying if you start to think that these kinds of analysis are being done secretly for, what, baby car seats? Are they saying, here, we can save some money on plastic in this little restraint, save a bunch of money and just pay for the baby deaths? I hope that's not happening, but this kind of evil really freaks me out. So let's go to the Anderson hearing. Now, because I'm a sneaky bastard, I changed four words in this article. I changed four words so you could look up who this is, so we can think of this in more general terms. Because if you've studied any of these issues, you will find Anderson sounds exactly like every bureau bureaucratic uh, leader when they are put on trial. So I made the words a little more generic by changing four words. When it says the company, it actually gave the company. When it says the CEO, it actually names the leader of this company. And notice it gets awkward where I said persons. That's because they were more specific. So I had to be generic and it's a little awkward. All right, so let's read it and let's talk about Anderson and see if this guy is normal or a psychopath. Hint, he's not a psychopath. Anderson's own attitude was different. First of all, the indictment for murder was wrong. With the killing of persons, I had nothing to do. I never killed a person or a non-person for that matter. See, that's where it gets awkward. I never killed any human being. I never gave an order to kill either a person or a non-person. I just did not do it. Would he then have pleaded guilty if he had been indicted as an accessory to murder? Perhaps, but he would have made important qualifications. What he had done was a crime only in retrospect, and he had always been a law-abiding citizen because the CEO's orders, which he had certainly executed to the best of his ability, had possessed the force of law in the company. Let's skip to the second paragraph. What he fervently believed in up to the end was success, the chief standard of good society as he knew it. Typical was his last word on the subject of the CEO. The CEO, he said, may have been wrong all down the line, but one thing is beyond dispute. The man was able to work his way up from an assistant manager in the company to a leader of almost 80,000 people. Oh, I changed that number a little bit, so that's five words I changed. 
His success alone proved to me that I should subordinate myself to this man. His conscience was indeed set at rest when he saw the zeal and eagerness with which good society everywhere reacted as he did. He did not need to close his ears to the voice of conscience, as the judgment has it, not because he had none, but because his conscience spoke with a respectable voice, with the voice of respectable society around him. So, what should we say? Let's talk briefly about what is in Anderson's excuses and his rationalizations, right? Let's list them. First, his main justification is the one you always hear in these sorts of trials. I was obeying the laws, I was following orders, I was, and here's my favorite, just doing my job. Good? Now, that's creepy. But, notice his other, other ideas. He is seeking success. And please know, I've studied this guy. He wasn't just a douchebag looking for more money and for a promotion. He was actually trying to do good work and being appreciated for doing hard work. Those are actually my motivations. I'm not motivated by salary. I'm motivated by feeling like I'm doing a good job and once in a while having students appreciate my work. Maybe even a dean will say, hey, I hear you're doing a good job. What else is going on? He is also following in the footsteps of a successful person. I mean, geez, he should write a self-help book. Look at the self-help bookshelves in a bookstore. They're all full of follow the habits of successful people. Silly, right? Uh, go and read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers to see what the real trick to being successful is. Hint, hint, it's mostly luck. Then he also says, or sorry, the article, the reporter says, he was just following good society. Would the people around him have thought he was doing great? Yes. They would have saw how he was getting promotions. They would have saw how polite and successful he was. And he would have made a great neighbor because, by the way, he was a very polite and law-abiding guy. What is the message overall? He doesn't sound that different from any of us. Most of us, even the best of us, have these sorts of motivations. We want to do a good job, we want to feel appreciated, and the really great Americans also seek after promotion and success. He sounds like a standard person to me. We will learn more about who he is later. That's a teaser. Thanks for listening to me. I hope this was okay. Thanks.